Hi everyone, welcome to another video for research design and analysis. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about some of the assumptions for our regression models. In the previous modules, we've talked about simple regression when we have continuous predictors, and we've talked about regression where we have categorical predictors. These assumptions are gonna to apply to all of our regression models pretty broadly. There are you know, some advanced topics and like different types of models we'll get into in the future that have special considerations. Uh, and there's also more detail about really how to kind of test these assumptions. But in today's video, I wanna give a broad overview of the assumptions and how we can visualize them using some common graphs. So first off, you know, what, what do we mean when we talk about regression assumptions? Well, in the past videos, you know, I've often said, you know, the p-value is the probability of observing data this extreme or more extreme, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, and assuming that all of the other assumptions are true. Thus, a low p-value suggests that the data we observe are unlikely under the null if all of those assumptions hold. Another reason we could get a low p-value is that one of our other assumptions is violated. So to make sure that we're interpreting that low p-value correctly and that we really are rejecting the null hypothesis when we should be, it's important that we check on our other regression assumptions to make sure that they are at least approximately true, okay? Because we're essentially holding up our data to a model, uh, and if our model is bad, uh, then, then the inferences that we draw from that will be bad. So we wanna make sure that all of our assumptions are at least approximately supported by what we observe in order to make sure that we have a robust interpretation of the standard errors that we're calculating and of the p-values that we're calculating. So this then begs the question, what exactly are the assumptions? And these will vary a little bit from situation to situation, but we have some general regression assumptions that will apply broadly, and we're gonna talk about those in this video. Before I do that though, the thing I wanna emphasize is that these regression assumptions apply to the errors of our model, not the data. So oftentimes people think that these regression assumptions apply to the data that we're modeling, but actually these regression assumptions apply to the residuals. So in most of the plots that we look at today, we're gonna to be looking at the residuals or what's left over after we've created a regression model and made our specific predictions. So what do we actually assume then when we're doing these regressions? Well, the first assumption is about linearity of the relationship. So when we're actually looking at y as a function of x, we assume that this is a linear relationship, right? Or at least an approximately linear relationship. If we can see that there's a clear deviation away from linearity, that means we either need to adopt a different kind of statistical model or perhaps make our statistical model a little more complicated. The next assumption is independence. So independence uh, is the idea that each of the errors is independent of the next, right? Knowing one person's residual doesn't help us guess the next residual in the data set. So for those of you who are familiar with these terms, uh, this is essentially assuming that all of the data vary between subjects rather than that they vary within subjects. So right, we don't have me repeated measures that are coming from the same person because then those errors are more likely to be similar because they both came from the same person or that there's no real kind of clustering or grouping to the observations in our study. So for instance, we might have one data point per person, but if those people are coming from the same family, then we have to account for the fact that our data are nested within different families, right? Because that would create a certain type of statistical dependence. So we have to make sure that we don't have clustering of repeated measures in our data in order to make sure that we have independence of the errors. Third, we assume that there is a normal distribution of the errors. So we think that the errors should be approximately normally distributed, right, in order for our calculations of the standard errors and the p-values to be correct. Now, they only have to be approximately normal. They don't have to be perfectly normal, uh, but they do need to be at least approximately normally distributed for us to feel like our calculation of these p-values is robust. The fourth assumption is that we have a constant error variance. Um, and the way to think about that is that the errors are equally distributed along the regression line. So if you think about kind of a cloud of data points and your regression line is going through them, then if we have constant error variance, there shouldn't be like, you know, one part of the regression line where the data fit really well and then another part of the regression line where they fit really poorly. On average, we would hope that there's kind of just a cloud of data points that go around the regression line. So those are our four assumptions, right? And broadly speaking, linearity and independence are actually really big assumptions. Uh, if those things are violated, um, then our models can be very, very wrong. Uh, in contrast, normality and constant error variance are, are slightly relaxed assumptions. Um, most analysis of variance is 
robust to slight violations of normality and slight violations of, of constant error variance, or what we also call homoscedasticity. Um, so they're all important, right? But in general, uh, we really want to make sure that we don't mess these things up. Uh, we have a little bit more leeway in terms of our data can be approximately, or sorry, I should say our residuals can be approximately normal, and that our residuals can have an approximately constant variance, but they don't have to be perfectly normal and they don't have to be perfectly constant. So let's look at some examples uh, and some, some helpful charts that will, will get you started on visualizing these assumptions. And the first example we'll use involves a continuous predictor. So as you recall, we had the change in a person's VO2 max between an assessment at sea level and then an assessment at altitude as a function of what altitude we took that person up to. Uh, and we can see using this kind of smooth regression line here, this isn't a perfectly linear relationship. So if we actually want to model these data, we need to adopt a regression model that isn't going to force a straight line between y and x. Instead, we want something that's going to allow for a little bit of curvature. So if there's evidence of a nonlinear relationship, then you'd need to select a more complex or different model than something that's a simple linear function. Um, so you can make things curvilinear. So for instance, we could have uh, the change in VO2 max as a function of the test altitude and the test altitude squared. Adding in that squared predictor is going to give us a curvilinear function. Um, or we could adopt something truly nonlinear, uh, where we have a, a different so sort of mathematical model. You know, so things like exponential decay, exponential growth, logarithmic functions, those kinds of things would be truly nonlinear functions. So if we don't have a linear relationship, that's okay. It just means we need to make our model a little more complicated or we need to adopt a slightly different regression approach. So next, with the assumption of independence, this is a little harder to see visually, and it often comes down to more what you know about your study design uh, than your ability to you know, kind of plot some of these things on, on a graph. But what it ultimately comes down to is how are your data points clustered, and is there any clear relationship among the residuals? Uh, so here I'm plotting our residuals as a function of the participant ID number in this experiment. Uh, and you can see you know, some of them are close together, some of them are far apart, and they just generally tend to bounce around a lot. Uh, and we can't you know, consistently say that uh, you, if you have one residual, then it, uh, like positive residual, then it's necessarily followed by a negative residual, or that a small residual is necessarily followed by a big residual. Right? Uh, but most importantly is what we know about the design. Each of these people was brought into the lab uh, and they were randomly, or well, I should say at least they were pseudo-randomly recruited from the, the population, right? Because they were responding to flyers and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but they were randomly assigned to different elevations in the experiment. Um, so we know that we have one observation per person and there's no known clustering or relationship between in those individuals. None of them, you know, are coming from the same family or, or something like that. Next, we have the assumption of normality. So the, the best way to see this is when we can look at the normality of our residuals in what's known as a quantal quantal normal plot. So this normal QQ plot over on the left shows us the standardized residuals as a function of the theoretical quantiles. Uh, so the way to think about that is on the y-axis, we have what the residuals actually were. And on the x-axis, we have what those residuals hypothetically should be if they followed a perfectly normal distribution. Um, so we'll get into more detail about exactly how to calculate this as time goes on, but you can see that we've got this straight line on the diagonal here, and that would be a perfectly normal distribution. Uh, so you could see that the residuals bounce around that line, and in general they cleave to it pretty closely. We do have some deviations away from it, um, but overall I would say that this isn't terrible. This is a relatively normal distribution of residuals uh, uh, for, for these data. The other way we can see that is actually just by plotting the density of the residuals. So here's a density plot where we're looking at the, the likelihood essentially of getting a residual of a particular value. And you can see that kind of at the upper end, it's a pretty normal looking curve, but we do have some negative skew in these data uh, where, where it's not a perfectly normal distribution of residuals. We have, we have a few uh, issues here in kind of the thickness of the tail uh, on the, the negative side, where we get away from a normal distribution. And that's reflected in the deviations away from normality here uh, in, in the normal QQ plot. So these aren't perfectly normal. And again, in future model modules, we'll get into exactly, you know, how do you test this? How non-normal does it need to be? 
but just on a qualitative impression, I would say that these data look okay. We are normal enough that I think our standard errors and our p-values would be robust to this violation. Finally, we can look at the, the homogeneity or the consistency of the error variance. And there are different ways for looking at this, uh, but in general, we plot the residuals on the y-axis in some form as a function of the fitted values on the x-axis in some form. Uh, so this is the decrease that's actually being predicted by the model here on the x-axis. And in the left-hand panel, I just have the, the raw residuals, right? So zero would be, we perfectly predicted uh, what that person's uh, decrease was. Positive values would be we underestimated, right, and therefore they were actually a little bit higher than that. Negative values would be we overestimated and they were actually a little bit lower than that. You can see that in general, this looks like a pretty, you know, evenly spread cloud of points. Um, and I, in fact, I can draw a best fit line through these data and it's really quite flat. There's not really reliable evidence for a change in the size of the residuals, or I should say the bias in the residuals as a function of the fitted values. The other way that people often look at this, though, is that they will transform these residuals in some way to make them all positive. So one common formulation for doing this is to take the square root of the absolute value of the residuals. Right? So the absolute value makes all the residuals positive, and then taking the square root helps reduce the influence of potentially large outliers in any one direction. Again, we're looking at the residuals, though, on the y-axis as a function of the fitted values on the x-axis. Now you can see that there is a little bit more evidence of a, of a tilt to this line where at uh, small uh, fitted values, right, so declines closer to zero, we generally tend to have smaller residuals than when we had larger fitted values. Our, uh, so what this is essentially saying is our model is making more accurate predictions among those people who had a small decrease and it tends to make less accurate predictions among those people who had a large decrease. Um, so there is some evidence for heterogeneity, right, uh, or, or a lack of homoscedasticity here. But again, kind of qualitatively speaking, this doesn't look too bad. There's not a real reliable shape to these data points. Uh, this more or less looks like a cloud of points. Um, and, and I think we have a relatively constant error variance here. Okay, so next let's look at the same plots but with an example from a categorical predictor. So we'll turn again to our, our example we used in the last few videos where we're looking at SAT scores as a function of whether or not someone took the SAT prep course or they did not take the course. Uh, one nice thing here, when we only have two groups, linearity basically has to be met because the line between any two points is going to be linear. So there can't really be evidence of a nonlinear relationship here. It looks like the, you know there's a linear relationship between uh, whether you took the course, or sorry, there, we can easily draw a nice straight line between whether you took the course and whether you didn't take the course. And then the effect of taking the course on your SAT scores is well approximated by a linear relationship. Next, again, with independence, right, that's a little bit harder to see visually, um, but we know that people were randomly assigned to these different groups based on the experimental design. So again, we've got the black dots if you did take the course, the gray dots if you didn't take the course, right? Uh, this is where, you know, we, if we don't see a reliable pattern in the distribution of the residuals, um, we, then, then we feel pretty good about, you know, independence being achieved, but it really comes down to what we know about the study design. Right? So let's say that we have these two dots that both have negative residuals and these two dots that both had positive residuals. If these were actually two assessments from the same person, right, then th we'd have a person who generally tends to be more negative than average. And this, if these were two dots from the same person, then we'd have a person who generally tends to be more positive than average. So our ability to kind of see the pattern in the residuals depends on what we know about the structure of the data. But since we know that each of these data points is coming from a single person who is randomly assigned to different treatment groups, uh, these data are relatively independent. Again, we can assess normality using our quantal quantal normal plot. So on the y-axis, we have our standardized residuals, right? So this is the actual distribution of residuals. Uh, and on the uh, x-axis, then we have the theoretical quantiles if the residuals followed a normal distribution. Uh, so you can see here, uh, we get a bigger deviation away from normality than we had in the previous example. Um, where you know this this person should have a value of about a negative two, but they really have a value of like a negative one point you know five or so uh, in the data. Uh, 
So that's only one data point out of several, but we are seeing a distribution away from normality here. Uh, and that's also reflected then in the negative skew that we see in this density plot, where again, for kind of the, the, the right-hand curve of the plot, those residuals look relatively normally distributed, but we seem to have a preponderance of negative residuals down here that is widening and thickening the tail of the density plot. Uh, so this might be due to you know, a single outlier uh, who, who kind of is throwing off some things in the data, um, but it's not terrible. I would say again, like these data are approximately normal. I might consider some sort of transformation of the data or maybe just you know, checking out that person's data point to see um, you know, is there a reason why they are systematically different from somebody else. Um, but this is a bigger violation of normality, so it's a little bit more of a concern. But still, I would say this isn't really that bad because by and large, our residuals are well approximated by this diagonal line here in the quantal quantal normal plot. Similarly, right, we can calculate constant error variance the same way we did when we had the continuous uh, regression. So if we look at our residuals on the y-axis as a function of the fitted values, right, or we can transform those residuals to look at the square root of the absolute residuals, making everything positive, what we're looking for now right, is if there's any tilt or slope to this line. When we have categorical groups, right, so we're predicting the mean for the no uh, course group and we're predicting the mean for the course group, it won't really look like a cloud the same way when we had a continuous predictor. But what we're looking for is, is the spread of the residuals here approximately the same as the spread of the residuals here. Um, so we can see that a little more cleanly actually in this graph over here on the right, where this distribution is pretty similar, right? There's a little bit more variability among those individuals who did take the SAT prep course, but there is not a reliable difference, uh, right, in, in kind of the, the, those distributions. So in, in this case, I would say that we have pretty constant error variance. It looks like the assumption of homoscedasticity is met in these data. So again, those are our general linear modeling assumptions. Uh, we looked at them in both a continuous example and an example where we had a categorical predictor. Um, so I hope that is helpful for giving you kind of a framework for how to think what are the assumptions and conceptually what do we need to look at. Um, we'll get into more detail about these regression assumptions and we'll explore them in different study designs as we go along. So we'll say, okay, what if I've got three independent groups? Or what if I have a repeated measure and therefore I violate the assumption of independence? Okay, so as we approach those different types of study designs, we'll look at the assumptions in each case and how to assess them. In the meantime, however, keep these assumptions in mind, right, and think about them when you're designing your studies or evaluating data.